I want to say hello, especially to the hundreds of you who have emailed me in the last three or four days. I feel like I know you all better. Um, welcome to the final class of University Q2 <laughs> Well, this is what it takes to get applause. Yeah. Okay. So let me give you an overview of what we're going to do today. Okay. We're going to start uh, with a uh, brief lecture by President Armagnana, who I will introduce in just a minute. I'm, I'm going to wait just a second. I know you're really excited. <laughs> After Dr. Armanano's uh, presentation, we will invite all of the uh, deans who, uh, well, not quite all of them because one has retired since she uh, spoke to you, and the other is actually away on a family emergency. But almost everybody who presented this semester will be here in a panel. They'll go over uh, briefly some of the ideas that they uh, wanted you to, to, to walk away with. And while that's going on, the TAs have note cards. If you have any questions that you would like to ask relative to the course, to any one of the deans, or to just people in the group, or a specific team, please write it down and hand it to your TA. You can I don't know if the note cards are out there now, but if you if you need one, you can just hand it to your TA and your TA will get it to me. Then probably with about half an hour left in the class, we will then uh, put on the um, on the overhead on the overhead anymore. We will project the final question for the essay. You will write one page. I see you all bought notebooks and hopefully pens as well. And we also, some of the TOs have, have already passed out at evaluation, others uh, are holding on to it, but we will ask you to fill out anonymously an evaluation of the course, which will help us figure out what we did well. Everybody's pretty excited today, huh? Thanks. So then, um, you will fill out, so you'll finish the essay, which you will obviously put your name on, and you then will fill out the anonymous survey, which will help us a lot. Um, in addition, after class is over, starting at 10 o'clock this morning through the end of the week, we will have a couple of surveys on, on Moodle, and if you fill them out, they'll be anonymous. There won't be any way to know who completed which survey, although Moodle will know that you did it, which will give you two extra credit points for each one of the surveys. They're, they're, each one is different and fulfills a different purpose. The ones on, uh, the ones on Moodle, one of them is the, is the study, the student evaluation of teaching effectiveness, which is used in almost every course. And that will allow us to compare in general the teaching in this course to all of the other courses that you take. And that'll be very helpful. And then the last one is actually one of our uh, TAs um, is uh, doing a master's uh, project, and she's interested. She's been kind of watching and interested, and so she's got a survey uh, answering some que asking some questions related to some research that she's doing. You're not required to answer it, but if you do, it'll be anonymous, and you will get two points extra credit. So. Um, before I introduce uh, President Armagnana, I just want to—I want, I want to give some general thanks. I know that for a lot of you, first of all, I want to thank you. Getting here at eight o'clock in the morning, most of you staying awake—that's uh, really great. And I know this course was a challenge in a lot of ways. It required a lot of independent work. Um, I know that Moodle was a challenge, but we, we really appreciate your um, continued goodwill and hope that you have uh, found the course worthwhile. Um, but you know, unlike most classes where you just go in the room and the room's kind of there and ready and everything's all set, this is a, this is a new adventure coming to uh, Wild Hall. And I just want to name a few people who, who made this happen, or groups of people, because it, it, takes, it took a village. It took the whole university, really, to make it happen. First of all, uh, to the president and the provost and the deans. Obviously, they uh, gave up their time. They're exceedingly busy. And coming here and being a part of this course, I think, was a lot of fun, but it also was uh, um, a lot of work. 
Uh, the TAs, I don't know if you know how much work the TAs had to do. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, they're getting about 50, 60 emails a day right now, and they were expecting to have much smaller groups, maybe 20 or 30, and they ended up with about 100 students each. So um, if they didn't answer their, your email immediately, there was probably a good reason. They also are taking classes as well. And also, Jimmy Greyhouse, who, who was the coordinator of the dean, a lot of them are doing. Linda Eichhorn is the, uh, is the, the uh, assistant in Dean Butler's office. She took on a lot of the um, administrative duties related to, to this class. The IT staff, you know, this was a real strain on Moodle. Um, I know it was a strain on you, but Moodle was pushed to the test. And, uh, um, there were two people especially who worked and are continuing to work hours a day on this, um, Barbara Moore and Martha Rizal. Police services had to come over here and direct traffic. Mark Mark Reisman and Kennedy Sullivan organized all of the community service. The ropes course staff, that was, they added how many ropes courses? 25 or 30 or some number. And also Dean Silver, whose office paid for it. It cost, I don't know, $10 a person, something like that. This was covered by Dean Silver. Um, so thank you to them. And maybe most of all, the Green Music Center staff, the Wow Hall staff, maybe 10 people who uh, got here every morning before 8 o'clock, and they might have been here the night before until midnight doing a concert, and then they might have had a concert the next, that same night, so they may have, may have been here from 7 in the morning until midnight. Um, they were, everything worked every time. It was really amazing, and I want to thank all of you. I know this was, uh, this was a lot of work, so I hope you all thank them for their work to make it happen here in, in, uh, in beautiful Wild Hall. So, so now we get to the we get to the final the final day and the final uh, lecture, and I'm really delighted to say that we have President Armiano here to speak to you, and I want to give a brief. Um, he said keep it brief, but there's a lot to tell. So I want to give you a, a brief bio of Dr. Armiano. Dr. Ruben Armiano was born in Cuba. In 1961, he fled his home and settled in Hillsboro, Texas, with an aunt and uncle. As he describes it, he arrived as a refugee with a change of underwear and a dime in my pocket. He earned an AA degree in economics and political science from Hill College and a BA degree in economics, political science, and Spanish, and an MA degree in Latin American economics and political science from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Armaniana moved to New Orleans in 1969 and worked for three years as Director of Operations and Training for the Inter-American Center at Loyola University, New Orleans. From 1972 to 78, he worked as an Administrative Analyst and Organizational Development and Training Consultant for the City of New Orleans. He also worked as a part-time news anchor and reporter at WWL-TV from 1971 to 1981 and continued as a television news consultant through 1988 for the only daily Spanish-language news program, program on Louisiana television. Then he earned his PhD in political science from the University of, of New Orleans in 1983. At Tulane University, he served as executive assistant to the senior vice president for operations from 1983 to 85, director of the Institute for the Study of Change in the Americas from 1985 to 88, and vice president assistant to the president from 1985 to 1988. He also held a faculty appointment in international business and political science. He worked in the private sector from 78 to 83 as Vice President of Commerce International Corporation, a New Orleans-based international trading company. In 1988, Dr. Amignano moved to California to serve as Vice President for Finance and Development at Cal Poly Pomona from 88 to 92, where he held a faculty appointment in political science. Then in 1992, Dr. Amignano was appointed the sixth president of Sonoma State University. He is professor of political science and teaches periodically. He'll be teaching in a fifth minute. During his term of office, the university has constructed the Gene and Charles Church Information Center, completed the renovation of Darwin Hall Science Building, built the Student Recreation Center, added residence hall units that house a total of Remember, I had it 2,400, but I think it's more by now, maybe around 3,000 students on campus. 
just to take a look at that for us. Thank you. I uh, completed the environmental technology center that models green building techniques and constructed the green music center where we are today. In addition, the university acquired the 411 acre Fairfield Osborne Preserve in 1997 from the Nature Conservancy and the 3500 acre Galbraith Wildlands Preserve in 2004. In 2005, Dr. Armignano was named to the list of 100 most influential Hispanics by Hispanic Business Magazine. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you the president of Phenomena State University, Dr. Ruben Armignano. Nothing more frightening to hear your life story at 8 o'clock in the morning. First, I want to thank all of you uh, for coming uh, this morning. I know you have to. Uh, I'm not sure I would get up at 8 o'clock to listen to myself. Uh, but if, if anything, this class, uh, when you look at the assessment of it, one of the things that I think that has to be put there is that 760 students are out at 8 o'clock in the morning. I have to admit, when I was a student a uh, long time ago, dinosaurs were roaming the earth, I took my, as a freshman, I took a class at 8 o'clock. I did okay. I swore I would never take another one. And throughout the years of education, I managed never to take an 8 o'clock class again. Therefore, I'm up very early in the morning. I just not looking at people uh, that are in the morning. Uh, what I thought would do today uh, is to do some cooking. Uh, I I like cooking. I like eating even more than cooking. And if you uh, if you would have seen me a number of years ago, it shows how much eating I like. Uh, I have lost a bit of weight, about a hundred pounds. Uh, but I still, on occasion, uh, like to cook. And I lived in New Orleans, as John uh, Conso told you, uh, for about 18 years. New Orleans has wonderful music and wonderful food. And uh, it's a city also that never sleeps. Uh, therefore, one of the dishes that is uh, very uh, famous and very common, primarily on Monday, is uh, gumbo. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means and what. But what we're going to try to do today is to cook my version of what I call uh, leadership uh, gumbo. Now, before you go to the kitchen and start chopping up things and mixing things and things, you have to have vision. You have to have an idea of what your dish is going to be. You have to have an idea of how it's going to look, how it's going to smell, uh, how it's going to taste, uh, how it's going to make you feel and happy. That idea, the vision, is probably the most important part of leadership or cooking. You have to see it. You have to see it in your mind and you have to feel it in your body. Uh, you have to see what you want. Uh, what the outcome is going to be, uh, what the end product uh, looks like. Most of the time it's going to be a new thing, therefore there's no other one out there to uh, make a similar thing. And if it's, a, if it's about an institution, is how that institution is going to look when it's changed and how it would work. Therefore, it combines intellect and awareness, and it combines mind and body, uh, to put it all going to. That vision 
amalgamate your brain and your gut. And that, that is important. Now, there only a thing exists in your mind first. Perhaps later, or you can put it in writing or make speeches about it. And it's a bit crazy because you can see it and at that moment nobody else can see it. And that could be a definition of crazy. You see something, you know something, you feel something, but nobody else does. Uh, and probably that is the most difficult and dangerous part of leadership, uh, especially leadership for change, because it has not been done before, and there's nothing specific that others can see and touch as you can see it. And since it has not been created yet, it is, for, it is therefore very easy to dismiss, kill, ridicule, postpone, and deprioritize. Nelson Mandela, the uh, great leader of South Africa, uh, is now in his late 90s uh, and trail, and, uh, and after spending a long time in jail, basically solitary confinement for his son, fight against, against apartheid, said everything is always impossible until somebody does it. Imagine somebody in jail, totally isolated, who would imagine how South Africa would change from a separated society to a united society. He knew it. He felt it, and he lived his life to I have a fear of some of my there is a professor who has been a continuously incessant critic of mine. I have never done a damn single thing that he has approved. And he signs all of his mails now with two quotes from me in reference to this building, uh, to the Green Music Center in Wild Hall, which he believes supports his criticism of something that I have done wrong. The first part from me, one is, is from the Bohemian, when I said, when conceived, the Green Music Center was a crazy idea. And then, another quote from the San Francisco Chronicle, who I said, I felt the GMC was a doable in Senate. This was the quote from right. I have said those things, and I believe them. And I agree that vision has that thing of insanity because you are seeing the future. Uh, and, you know, I have been accused of many things and including to have a bit of insanity, I suspect, because I have seen things that uh, others could not have seen at that moment. And most of those things have become reality. Now, from that vision, you now work backwards to develop an act on the numerous steps in, in what it can be a long process of getting the vision to become a reality vision. Now, it will never be exactly what you first envisioned. It will change with the time, with the process. It will make such an adoption. Uh, the building will be bigger, be smaller. Uh, the university will have X students instead of Y students, etc. But the overall vision stays the same. Don't expect to be exactly the same. Uh, now, the vision without action is just scientific. Action without vision is misleading and a waste of resources. But vision associated with action can modify the world. This word was said to me a long time ago by a very good friend of mine, Dr. Paulo Mora, uh, uh, from uh, Brazil. Now, 
and doing virtually change. It is a risky proposition. That's it. One, we are have a culture of insanity because we are seeing things that others cannot see. It's not there yet, uh, and therefore it creates issues. Uh, I'm sure in some of your classes, if you haven't done it yet, at some point, uh, you should read uh, The Prince by Machiavelli. You have a sense here that it's Machiavelli. But Machiavelli was an Italian, a Florentine uh, philosopher, uh, practitioner of politics, who wrote this book about government. And he called it The Prince. And then he says, there's nothing more difficult to carry out, no more doubtful of success, no more dangerous to handle, but to initiate a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies and all who profit by the old order, and only look one defender in, in all of those who profit by the new world. So at the beginning, we have lots of detractors, and even those who are supporters, I tend to be a little bit moved on because they haven't seen it yet. So they have to have faith in it. Now, let's start cooking. As I tell you, I live in Louisiana, and gumbo is a national dish of Louisiana. It has been described in the following manner. The gumbo is a pungent mixture inherited from Africa and the West Indies and perfected by the Cajuns. The Cajuns were the French descendant who came uh, from France to Canada and then down the Mississippi and settled in, uh, in southern Louisiana. Uh, there's a couple of uh, reality history channels uh, who have things about the Cajuns chasing alligators and etc. So they are an interesting group of people speak still a dialect of French. They are very much living the bayous, the sort of a swamp, and uh, they are very tied to the environment. Uh, they are hunters uh, and fishermen, uh, most of them. This gumbo is a form of a super stew. It allows for the economical use of what remains of shellfish, game, fowl, or meat or any of those things put together which is used as a day. Now, from the recipe are precious things. And while there is a sort of what you say, gumbo as a generic, every gumbo is different. And every cook starts his or her, her recipe who comes from the family uh, like a great special procession. Only after you are married and have proved to be a suitable mate that the other family is willing to share that recipe with you. So, so I'm going to give you my recipe. Uh, the secret of this dish is the art of blending of all unique flavors, herbs, vegetables, seafood, meat, including alligator, poultry, spices, water, oil, and flour. Very simple. In other words, it's what you bring to this pot. Your talent, your skills, your education, your knowledge, experiences, your successes, your failures, your ambition, and your vision. You bring what you have, not what you wish you had. Those of you who might go to the kitchen to get something to eat, it's, you know, once you open the refrigerator or the pantry, it's that it's there. It's not that we wish it was there, that means going to save one. And I'm not ready to go to save one. And to lazy to do that, you know, I have to make do with what is there. And again, it is what you bring uh, by who you are. Uh, and you blend it in a way which is unique to you, your own recipe, you make the best you can make. 
Not only this, it has a base. The base of the gumbo is called a roux, R-O-U-X. That's not going to be on the side of it. Uh, and that is a very slow blending of flour and oil. And you combine those two ingredients, simple ingredients, flour, oil, and by putting them together, different variations, some people put more flour, other people put more oil, and you cook it slowly, so there's low heat, uh, and you have to constantly stir it, so it won't burn. Some people like the root dark, some people like the root uh, light. I like mine, Carabelle, uh, which is a good for your color. Uh, but one thing it is, that root, that day, has to be smooth, then to be rich. Without the root, there's no gum. Forget about the space, the meat, etc. If you don't have a good root, you don't have it. So it's very important how these two simple ingredients make the base of the food. Now, the color of the root, the base, in this intellectual gumbo is your character and your values. These are the pillars that support your own personality. They have been acquired early on in life with the assistance of your family, and in many cases your church, and there's no pretending about it. If those foundations are not solid, success will only be temporary. Eventually, you will fail and fail you. And we see that in many public figures who have achieved great things, but because their values, their character are not strong, are not well placed, at some point they make big mistakes and they fail. And they are embarrassment to themselves and others. Therefore, you have to have your own color, and it must be smooth. It is you and nobody else. Very individual and success. Now, before we have now mixed this thing, and we now have a good room, and we need now to add vegetables. Uh, and Bumble has a lot of vegetables, primarily for the good Catholic of Southern Louisiana we call the Holy Trinity. And the Holy, and the Holy Trinity of Bumble is onions, green peppers, and stuff. You thought I was going to take you on a religious event, I took you on a cooking event. Holy Trinity. When you in Louisiana talk about the Holy Trinity, you're talking about onion, celery, and peppers. Uh, you can add, you add other vegetables, including some things that by itself, because it's a little bit sticky for okra, and you add tomatoes, and you add other things, but well, that's the thing. Now, to me, that holy trinity in the intellectual gumbo is your education, your personal responsibility, and your integrity. And you are judged by these three ingredients. Uh, and if you don't have the appropriate mix, uh, you will not be able to exhibit your own personality, etc. So you have to uh, bring your education, and that's what you're here for. And that really is, to a large extent, the core of the liberal arts that generalize education to allow you to expand your mind, you have to bring your own responsibility, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, and you have to have integrity. I think it's important that we learn very early on to take responsibility for everything that happens or does not happen in our own world. It is an attitude that says, if it exists in my life, then I allow it to exist. 
I'm not sure if all the psychologists and sociologists would agree with that, but it is my belief. The source of the belief is that if there are changes that need to be made, it is my responsibility to identify those changes and to do what is necessary to accept them. This attitude is even more important than the full ability to control things. Because by having this attitude that I am responsible for myself and what happens to me uh, and what does not happen to me, I'm able to have a wider range of personal potential. Uh, for what I would call to personal strength of ability. In a sense, it wrestles away faith, uh, which is defined by societal circumstances with personal responsibility. That means even if you're born poor, or disadvantaged, or handicapped, etc., it means that you should not be constrained, impoverished, or limited. Now, therefore, in this bundle, we're now reaching the point where it's becoming, it's becoming a credible issue. You stand by your own values, by what you believe, and by what you say, in a sense, you are dependable. One of the most important characteristics of success, especially in a personal relationship, but also in a business relationship, is how dependable you are. Can I count on you in good and in bad? In a sense, that sounds like a marriage uh, ceremony. You know, basically you are asked at the marriage ceremony, are you going to be dependable in good and in bad, in sickness and in health? In most relationships, be it personal, be it business, be it political, fail because of lack of dependability on one or all parts. So being dependable is very important. Now, we now have a dependable dish coming around, and now we need to add meat. Uh, my own favorite dumb is one made with seafood, shrimp, crab, meat, crab claws, oysters, fish. But there are other types of dumbbells. There are somewhere about a turkey, alligator, sausage, chicken, venison, and even, remember, the Cajuns live in the wild, even nutria and squirrel, too wild for me. Uh, but you decide a combination. That's your combination. Uh, this needs to me translate in this gumbo as both organization, planning, and action. Go for Both organization, planning, and action. And they're in sequence. You set goals, you organize the resources to obtain the goals, you plan for implementation, and then you take action that will lead to those goals. It is considered action based on disciplined behavior. And therefore, success is a series of small plan action sequences that are followed by an evaluation of what has been accomplished, make adjustments as necessary to the action, and based upon the experience that you are now learned, take another action. Therefore, it is this operating in this kind of sequence, goals, organization, planning, and action, that should make you behave in every aspect of your professional or personal uh, life. Now, Another part of this success is that competence. And here, here you're educated, you have great value, you're dependable, 
there's another component to that. And, and also, if you have all of those things, you are competent. But this competence must be accompanied by comfort. The combination of efficiency coupled with the ability to put others at ease. Uh, and if you do that, I think you are rewarded by success. Now, as John told you, but the minute I open my mouth, uh, you could hear uh, that I was not born in the United States. Um, I speak with a fairly uh, strong southern accent, uh, so southern that it's beyond uh, the border. Um, and I came to this country with a strange, long, difficult to pronounce last name and had a wealth of a dime. But because of what I have done, etc., I have accomplished uh, quite a bit, sometimes uh, to the great surprise of many, uh, including my mother at one time or another, who loved me much, but you know. I wonder what the hell I was getting to when I did not become a medical doctor. Uh, even mothers are very similar to <laughs> uh, But when I became a, a president, uh, there were very few Hispanics who were leaders in higher education in my uh, At that time, uh, probably you could come there with less than both uh, times. And uh, therefore, I am very aware that one of the things that is required is this sense of pioneering, uh, of the ability to function in an environment where uh, you have probably others like you might have not uh, been there before. Therefore, in that sense of pioneering, and it's just for everybody, you know, in every aspect, no matter if you were born in Walnut Creek or in Master Plan. Uh, it has as its a very root the ability to adapt, to be flexible, and perhaps to have emotional and spiritual sources of satisfaction, reward, and power. And those things are called the spices that make you dumpling. And you can add whatever is your recipe, uh, garlic, peppers, black, red, cayenne, salt, thyme, uh, bay leaves, etc. Uh, you make your, your taste, but it's what, uh, it's what you decide to do. And that is, I think, to a large extent, again, your things that you brought from your liberal arts uh, education, your skills of reading, writing, mathematics, and critical thinking, uh, coupled with the uh, insights that other things like art, music, uh, geography, sociology, psychology, even political science and economics brain uh, It is this well-rounded and system this or individual who has the skills uh, necessary to become a successful part of society by combining both your professional and personal skills. Now, I have put all those ingredients together, the whole uh, soup pot, and I add some liquid, water, chicken stock, a bit of sherry, and you bring them to a bowl, cook it for five hours uh, at a slow heat, and then you are about ready to eat. So there are some sticky ingredients. One you would not easily find. One is, especially you are from the summer, you can add this something called filet powder, which is made by, it's a product of the Choctaw Indian, and it's made with uh, leaves of sassafras. And you add that right at the moment where you take the pot out of the heat and it begins to settle, you add that and it acts as a thickening device, but also as a, a it has some 
a specific flavor. You are not to repeat the top. If you do that, after you put the gumbo, it becomes pink. And that, to me, is self-reliant. The gumbo, the filler uh, powder, I think, is the act of self-reliant. To move ahead, the independent, constructive direction, and this is what separates leaders from followers, and the raiders from conformers, achievers from the others. The independent of are able to set your own direction and move at your own beat rather than to the rhythm of others. It is the self-reliance, is the confidence that you have in yourself, is the quality that allows you to break from the past, take chances, and to have a personal and professional uh, vision. It's the ability to feel comfortable with yourself and with others, embrace who you are and, who, and what you bring to the table. Now, the ability to serve, and you add, the last things that you add is rice. We usually fry rice, uh, which adds to it. And to me, that rice is basically your network of family and friends. So you have kept in close contact and will support you in good and in bad times. Like a rice that supports a strong or weak gumbo, it is your friends, your family, your dogs, uh, to really bring you that support. Because remember, you do not achieve alone. You always do it in company. And finally, you add a bit of French bread, light, fluffy, crispy. And that, to me, is a sense of humor, mostly about yourself. The balance, what, what you take very serious what you do, but you do not take yourself that serious. Remember, dullness is not very appetizing. Uh, we need to, reach, uh, to teach all of us uh, the value of humor, and which is a special of ourselves to say. Therefore, that's sort of my recipe for you for what I call leadership gumbo. Uh, I wish I could have cooked it for you, but Lori would give me to a fault if I bring any food here, and I saw you all doing it all time. Now, let me conclude by saying a couple of things. For some people, uh, they believe that you should do everything that they want to do, or nothing that they want to do. There's an Arab proverb that says that nothing is impossible for the person who doesn't have to do it. And you get in life, in this business, lots of recommendations about what to do. I say that I have the easiest job of anybody at the university because everybody tells me what to do. Uh, my choice about what I take and what I not do. But for somebody who doesn't have to do it, making a recommendation about what to do is very simple. And ending by saying that effective change is not the formulation of elegant and cohesive plans, but the implementation of initiatives held together by a philosophical concept of moving forward. And that comes from a point called making stones. Every one of us can make stone soup. Everybody of us can have a vision. And we apply who we are with a great deal of discipline and forthrightness. Uh, you all can be achieved and be leaders for change. Thank you and appreciate it. Okay. Where is? We're going to spend about um, 
20 minutes uh, doing a sort of brief review of all the important things that you, that the deans have uh, shared with you over the course of the uh, semester. I have it on the, uh, on the, I have behind them the graphic that I showed you on the very first day and then sometime in the middle of the semester just reminding you um, of the different themes of the course. And uh, since I was asked this question, yes, the family is my family. I'm the handsome little guy on the right there, the one with the intelligence expression on his face. Okay. That was taken about uh, almost 60 years ago. Okay. So let's start with... Um, with uh, Dean Leader, who, as you can see, was the family person. So my field, if you remember, was a long time ago, um, was that I talked to you about social change, how does the society change, and then I talked to you about how families have changed historically over time. Um, by the way, I'm really glad to see that the audience is full again, so welcome back to class, those of you who've been missing a while, so it's good to see you. So I wanted to remind you that when I was talking about social change, what I had said was that if a society is going to change and you're going to play a role in it, you have to be changing the norms and values of a society, you have to be changing the popular culture of a society, and you have to change the laws and the institutions of a society. And if you're going to be a leader, it doesn't matter which one you work on, but all three of those areas have to be touched if something is going to be changed. When I talk to you about change, I talk about revolutionary change or evolutionary change. Revolutionary change being wiping the slate clean, starting all over again the way it happened in Cuba, the whole different regime taking over and setting up government and society. Or it can be slow over time, evolutionary, technological changes being an example of that. I also talk to you about plan, how does society plan social change? If it's going to be evolutionary, it doesn't have to be chaotic. It can be organized, and we can decide how we want to move a society along. And I talked about the process and the planning model, and how you can go through really studying a problem, and then figuring out what to do about it. I talked about incrementalism about how societies really never do anything particularly radical. They just change slowly over time, sort of like a staircase in which we add something. And then a budget gets cut and we drop everything and we start all over again. So it's kind of a staircase going up and down and up and down incrementally. It's jointedly but incrementally. And I also talked about a re-educational model of change where you could go out and change yourself by figuring out what you want to do and then fixing the society that you don't like and start fixing what you making it like what you do like. We talked about the conflict model. We talked about the elite power model. And we talked about ideology. And I asked you and challenged you to think about what is your ideology. Are you conservative? Are you liberal? Are you socialist? Are you communist? Are you anarchist? Are you none of the above? But somewhere behind all of the things you've learned, you have an ideology. So maybe you should start thinking about what that is. Then I used the family as an example of change, and we looked at world systems theory, the core, the periphery, the semi-periphery. We talked about a family-based economy, remember, kind of like the Walton, and families living together and earning together and growing things together. But then as the environment changed and needs of the economy changed, we began to see what we call the family wage economy where people would work out in the factories and come back and pool their resources with their family, still living together. But now we've moved into, or we moved past that, to a family consumer economy, buying things, shopping together, working together to move the economy along while purchasing and consuming. And then I talked about where we were heading next. We were heading into the family technology society where we come together around equipment and technology and the computer and 
and we have now become more cohesive of a first line in the world. And then from there, I challenge you to consider yourself a member of the global community so that you yourself can make changes and move our society along in a planned and organized fashion. I had fun teaching you. I really enjoyed the class. And um, I hope we'll actually do it again someday. So thanks for your indulgence. And then we'll just go right down the, down the line uh, and keep an eye on the, on the clock, Provost Gravison. Well, hopefully you all remember that my topic, because it happened very recently, was science and ethics. And we emphasized the fast pace of science, and we chose microbiology to illustrate that for two reasons. One, the subject area of microbiology is fairly recent. We didn't understand it until we could actually see microbes, and you'll all remember that happened in the 1600s when we invented the microscope. And the other reason for choosing microbiology is that's the branch of science that's given us all the tools to allow us to do biotechnology. And so that then gets us into the ability to manipulate organisms, which then gets us very much into the subject of bioethics. You know, how are we going to use these organisms? Should we be doing this kind of manipulation? And uh, should we be producing, for instance, genetically modified organisms that we eat, the food that we eat, the GMOs? Should to be successful, how we use the information to the human genome project. And we also looked at bioethics, not just purely from bioengineered organisms, but we've got the ability to manipulate nature now, and that gets us into a different kind of bioethics, and we're really looking at that by looking at the IMF experiment that was meant to solve global climate change. And so we realized that might not be a good idea to fertilize the oceans because of the potential for um, a bloom of toxic algae, which would be devastating. Um, we delved into the subject of microbiology in a couple of cases just so that you could understand how you actually make the tools that we use in biotechnology. Hopefully, the two areas that we took away would be the, the two vectors that we use, the plasmids that we find in some bacteria, and the viruses. And we also talk to you a little bit about microbiology in general. I hope that the two words that you take away are numerical abundance, abundance, and the other one being diversity. Those are the two attributes that microbes have. So what you should take away from it then, I hope, is first that we really need a science literate population. And I hope that you at least get an appreciation for how fast science is changing. And so when you have to weigh in on a question, you can go look up the information that's all out there ready available and actually weigh in on the ethical decisions that we're all going to have to, to make. And I also hope that you've got a, a feel for what biotechnology is capable of because we have to watch that as we go forward with moving exponentially fast. So, um, I enjoy teaching this class and um, thank you for being so patient. So, to America, I have your uh, PowerPoint behind you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Well, we took a risk. Uh, we took a risk, and uh, we actually did a session of this course fully online. And we faced the challenges. Uh, we're still facing some of the challenges, but I wanted to say that I was trying to keep in a theme of themes, and online education is certainly going to be something that you all will be engaged in in the future. And I am uh, convinced that as you learn more and integrate more and work with the technology more, uh, become self-motivated, you yourself will become change agents and, and use the technology appropriately. There's a few points that I wanted to make, and there's a number of things. I was warned that to use a PowerPoint was not going to be a good idea. And do you see why? Yeah. yeah uh, my, my bad. I'm sorry. Uh, there were a number of things that we covered in, in the section uh, from Smart Machines. 
And uh, those things were related to technology, but you know that you can't use technology without it having a social context. As we talked about smartphones, and I think about individuals that are walking on the campus of Sonoma State University, and I'll see three people walking down uh, a, a pathway, and they're all on cell phones, right? And they're not talking to each other. There's a huge change in the social context, and it is coming about in part because of technology. But without a doubt, and go ahead and go to technological change. Is it up there? Yeah. The next one. Thank you. Uh, technological change is really uh, encompasses everything that uh, President Armagnana talked about and all of my colleagues here uh, are discussing. And that is technological change is definitely a process of invention and, and think about thinking about this facility 12 years ago. And could you imagine that it would be something like this hall? Well, a few people did, and I have to congratulate them for doing that. Innovation. Technology innovation is happen happening very, very quickly. Diffusion, putting technology in place. But technology is a process, and you're going to be involved in that process. And we covered and talked about a lot of things that are related to technology. We saw a lot of different tools, a lot of different technologies that are getting, being put in place in a number of different fields. There's new ways of thinking that are coming about. And one question that I've asked myself, and I think you should ask yourself, and this came up on our quizzes, can a computer be constructed to think like a human? What do you think? Well, there are people that would argue the principles of cognitive computing say yes, that there will be cognitive computing and they will be making significant changes in the way we interact. The next big step I call making connections. Uh, the next big step is, is if you have a chance, if you care about this, this particular area at all, there is a YouTube video called Synapse, S-Y-N-A-P-S-E. It is incredible. It talks about the, top, <laughs> the development of cognitive computers and the way things are going in the future, and this is your future. The takeaways from this class, very quickly, technological change will continue to drive the global economy, social change, human communication, and how humans learn. Number two, computers and robots are quickly moving toward cognitive and often autonomous systems. And number three, your life will continually be affected by change, and technological change will be a prominent factor. You will see a significant change in technology, and it will make a difference in your life. It is one of the constants. Thank you. Okay. Leaders make a difference. A difference in the organization for which they work and the communities in which they live. If you learned about leadership this semester, it will be reflected not in the grade you earn in the class, but in the difference that you make in the world. We equip you with a number of tools to be successful in leadership. You are exposed to hundreds of books on leadership. You have a chance to hear from a number of leaders. My colleagues, these are leaders in their own right, in their own school. Mark Nelson, Sandy Weil, Matt Martin, Tony McGee from our leaders group, President Armagnotti today. All our leaders got perspectives for you, things that you can learn from. In the work courses, on the volunteer projects, you got a chance to learn about leadership from each other. And we're left with the fundamental question of which approach to leadership is going to be best for you. And you'll recall from our discussion that none of these approaches are going to be best for you. Fundamentally, a leader does what's necessary. A leader is aware of what's happening and acts accordingly. And so your challenge is to 
you discover which approach to leadership is going to work best for you. Now, leaders are made, not born. It's a lifelong journey. And fundamentally, everyone in this room can be a leader. If you're wearing a San Jose Sharp shirt or uniform, stand up for a moment, would you? I see a San Jose Sharp. There's a couple of you. Stay, stay standing, stay standing. Please stay standing. You guys can be leaders. The fight is who you lose for. Step, step, step. If you're wearing something that says Sonoma State University on it, please stand up and stay standing. Sonoma State University. You too can be leaders. If you're wearing a baseball cap, stand up. If you're wearing a sweatshirt, stand up. If you're wearing lots of players or very little clothing, stand up. That should be everyone in the hall. There you go. All of you can be leaders. Go out in the world and make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Um, that we talked about um, in the ground, uh, well, the questions we talked about in the section on the arts were, the big questions were, why is art important? And um, you might also say, why is particular art important? And, and both of you, the field of you have been down to the young museum, and it's still there, um, one of the most important paintings in the world. Um, and those of you who have been to this talk of the music have attested to uh, why certain art is important. We talked about art uh, being under the big umbrella of art that we include in, in that category for visual art, music, we talked about poetry. And we talked about how art is effective in the world and how art changes and what art does. And it seems clear to me that, that art doesn't get up and turn off the light. It's not, not how art changes. We look at Two particular instances of change agents in art, Robin Maplethorpe and Patty Smith. And we can look back at the years 1975 until now and understand that as leaders, a young working class woman from a working class family, and a man from a working class family will effectively change something in the art. What we look at today, what we listen to, what we read, has been affected by, by Patty Smith and Robert Miracle Fall. I want to see that my colleagues already sort of uh, have already addressed in terms of hard work. Uh, the kinds of ways that, that changes take place. And we were talked about this revolutionary and evolutionary change. And the arts, it seems to be uh, both. That, that sometimes a kind of revolution takes place. That's the kind of revolution that took place in 1975. We're about due for another kind of revolutionary change in both music and visual art. Literature. 
And uh, there's also a kind of evolutionary effect so that um, oftentimes in the art, when a revolution takes place, we don't necessarily know until we look back on it. Um, the other element in terms of sort of hard work and, uh, and the practice of craft um, is a kind of imaginative intelligence. Many of you answered the numerical question about whether computers could ever do what humans could do. One of the answers to that might be in terms of art. The kind of imaginative intelligence that, that humans have, that all of you possess in various degrees, is I would assert one of the things that makes humans distinct from computers. Well, good morning, everybody. I know we're pressed for time, so I'm going to go fairly quick here. Um, on the portion of the course that we um, that I led, we talked about science and change in science, but we sort of focused in on medicine and health, and we brought in several guest speakers that helped us think about how has medicine changed from the past, how is it changing into the future. We tied into um, your own personal health. How are you responsible in that um, aspect of your life? Uh, we also talked about the philosophical and cultural connections in medicine and health. And I think we tied um, our conversations to every one of the previous speakers in medicine, the change in medicine, it's connected to social change, clearly connected to ethics, because we heard from Bio Moran about biotech and personalized medicine, certainly tied to technology and where is that headed in its connection to science and medicine, uh, leadership in terms of what directions do we take, and your own personal role in your health um, is very tied into what Dr. these friends are talking about. And then, of course, as we get to education, being educated about medicine and your health is very important. So that was my couple weeks with you. Thanks a lot. Good so, morning, everybody. Um, we talked later early on, we talked about how schools have not changed. And that the only major change has been in the population and the people that are being served. Remember, we talked about the Sumerian boy who got punished for being late? We still punished for being late in this class. Things have not changed that much. The second thing that, that I had students do and to, and to think about, and I want to congratulate all of you, we actually carried out change in Sonoma County as a group. We did 586 days of community service for the county of Sonoma. Let's give everybody a big round of applause. That is a lot. And we will still open and still taking those reflections. I also want to talk about the opportunity that you have to create change within education. A student of mine started in school just, just last year. You probably heard about it. Probably heard about it in a relationship to the early childhood studies major. Over by Oliver, it's behind it. There's a park. There's going to be a new school there next year called University Elementary School. And that school is going to be a place where students in the early childhood studies program will be able to carry out internships, be able to learn how to work with uh, young children. The student of the United States started that. She took on the leadership role of pushing people within politics to make that happen. And I'm very confident that many of you in here will do the same thing. I'll think about, as one example, Jacob. Jacob has a vision for golf. He has a vision for what he wants to see happen with relation to the, to the, to the sport of golf. His community service project was focused on that, trying to bring in support to be able to do this. I think, as all of my colleagues do, that you can actually change because you can take on leadership roles and you can move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think that pretty well ties things together. I want to remind you of um, 
Uh, John, I said a few weeks ago, if you think of uh, change as being like a river, you've got various choices as to how you, you deal with that. You can stand in the river and let it knock you over, or you can fight against it. You can let it just take you along, or you can find a way to harness that, the energy of the river, and move in directions that you want to make a difference. To be a leader, you can make a gumbo, and you can make a gumbo that will change the world. So the last part of the course then is to try, for you to try to tie all this together. And of course, this could be a doctoral dissertation. Um, I wanna, the reason why I'm not opening it up to questions is because I want to make sure that you have enough time to think about this and, and to write about it. So what we're asking for, and I don't know, I tried to make it large font, but I will read it. Um, and so what we're asking you is in a page, make sure you put your name on that page, not on the survey. And in one page, write about how you see yourself in this ever-changing world. As a result of this course, or maybe particular parts of the course, and we just reminded you of the different parts. What is your understanding of the way social change is happening? And how does this conception of change impact your approach to your studies here at Sonoma State? or to your career eventually, or to your life, or to your role as a leader? What are you going to do about some of the things that you've heard this, this semester? So what we'd like you to do in the page is be sure to draw on some of the specific ideas or issues, obviously not all of them. You may want to choose one or two um, of, of the presentations that particularly impacted you. And, um, and, and in this essay, try to, try, to, try to tie what's going on with the course with your, um, with your idea of change and what you're going to do about it. What we'd like you to do is to write it, and then when you're finished, to please very quietly go to your TA, give your TA um, the, the, two, the, the essay and the um, survey, and I want to, again, I want to thank President Armaniano and Provost Rogerson and all of the deans for making this possible. This is a huge enterprise. I've had a great time. I never imagined that I would get to stand in Royal Hall and speak to a packed audience. Captive, but packed, nonetheless. So thank you very much, and good luck to all of you. I think we need to change our thanks. Uh, Professor John Kornfeld for all of his orchestration. 